In today's video, I'm going to be talking about one of the hardest decisions I think to make when we're talking about special needs trusts, and that is choosing a manager for your child's special needs trust, choosing the successor trustee. Honestly, the majority of families who come to see me about special needs trusts struggle to choose who will be successor trustee. Some of them have just named a family member or a friend just out of convenience or they can't think of anybody else. And some people just are like a deer in the headlights and they never actually come in to sign their trust. Now I know that's not you, but there are some people where that has gotten them stuck. And I understand this because choosing a successor trustee for a special needs trust is like choosing a surrogate financial parent. It's that important. So that's why we're delving deep into the different options when you're choosing a successor trustee for your special needs trust. Okay, so when you're looking for a successor trustee, as I mentioned, a lot of people default to a trusted family member or friend. Perhaps you have a, a sibling, who, you know, uncle so-and-so who really loves your child and you want to choose them for successor trustee. However, they might be your age, so they're not going to be around when your child gets older. So we really worry about longevity. The other thing we worry about when choosing a successor trustee, naming a family member, is what if this is a sibling or another really close relative of your child's? I have seen families fall apart because the, the disabled person was really resentful towards their sibling for managing money a certain way or not making distributions that they like and it really interferes with their relationship, which is horrible to see. So I usually suggest not naming a sibling as successor trustee. So you might just like throw up your paper now and just go, oh, well, Ellen, who am I gonna choose then? You've described all my options and you're saying none of them are good. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying you might have to dive a little bit deeper to find the appropriate successor trustee. So there's a few things that, that we look for. And usually we're looking for someone who's a professional, who's done this before, who has the experience, who has the credentials, who has the training, who has the liability insurance, we want somebody who knows what they're doing. And there's really two main categories of professionals. There's banks or trust companies, and then there's private professional fiduciaries. And each of them have their pros and cons. So for banks, I think banks can be a really good choice when somebody's managing more money or they have some complicated assets like rental houses, farms, other things that need more attention, a bank charges a flat fee. And so you wanna get your money's worth, right? So if you have more complex situations, a bank is a really good choice. Also, if your child lives in a different state or you're thinking they might move, it's good to name a bank because they might have branches in that other state. If you name an individual, it would be hard for them to check in on the child in another state. So in those situations, I name a bank. Another good thing about banks is typically they have teams. They, they should be hiring, I think, case managers who can check in on your child and have the, the care and responsibility for that role. We put into our special needs trust that the trustee can hire an advocate or a case manager who would work with the successor trustee. So keep in mind, the successor trustee is really point person here. They may not be doing all of the roles, but they're going to find another professional who specializes in that. For example, a successor trustee will be managing the money. So if, if you're naming a bank, the bank would manage the underlying assets. And this can be really good because it's included in the flat fee. However, if you have a different financial advisor who you really like, you may not wanna name a bank because the bank probably won't wanna work with your financial advisor. They'll just wanna manage the assets, the underlying assets. So if you have a financial advisor that you'd like to continue to manage uh, the special needs trust assets, then you should put that note in your special needs trust to make sure that it points towards the person you like. And then you should name a successor trustee who is willing to work with this financial advisor. There are a few banks that are, but talk to your financial advisor and find out. They'll be so happy that you asked them this question because this means you want them to continue ma managing the money, which I'm sure makes them happy. Now, there are some worries about banks that, that some people have. Some people feel like they're cold and impersonal, that they're really not talking with the child, that all they care about is earning the, the one, one and a half percent fee that, that they might be charging every year. Now, it really depends on the bank. You know, I know some very compassionate, wonderful banks 
that specialize in managing special needs trusts, they could be very good choices, okay? Other banks, perhaps uh, the reputation came from somewhere. Another option besides a bank is to name a private professional fiduciary. So this is a person licensed in the state of California to do just this, to manage a trust. And some private fiduciaries, not all, but some will manage special needs trusts. You want to find somebody, if you're thinking about this, who really has a lot of experience and has worked with many special needs trusts. I've done an interview with a professional fiduciary who I think is wonderful. And I invite you to watch that video so you can learn more about what a professional fiduciary does, what their take on the job is, and other great details, you can watch it right here. So what are some benefits of naming a private professional fiduciary? Well, one of them is that they can really develop a great relationship with your child. You'll want to name a beneficiary who lives fairly close by or has a team member who lives close by so that they can interact with your child regularly and they can make sure that they have the proper housing and uh, assistance and, and anything your child might need. Another nice thing about private fiduciaries is that they often charge less than a bank does. A bank usually charges one and a quarter, one and a half percent, and private fiduciaries might charge a, a lower percentage or they might charge hourly. It's up to the fiduciary and you should interview them as you're choosing a successor trustee. In the description below, I have an actual list of questions that you can ask private fiduciaries as you're interviewing around and trying to select one. Now, I think the main drawback of a private fiduciary, which all fiduciaries will admit, by the way, is that they're going to retire and or die. So private fiduciaries usually are at least in their 40s, maybe their 50s or 60s. They're probably not going to live as long as your child does. So you'll want to make sure that they have a succession plan set up. And sometimes that's one or more private fiduciaries who will take over their practice. Uh, it could be several different ways, but you'll want to look into, you know, how is that set up to be able to make sure that there's an easy transition or that you feel comfortable with the successor fiduciary. Another drawback is that a private fiduciary is usually local. They serve their local community. And so if your child lives in a different state, a private fiduciary may not be the best option for you. Okay, so another option for successor trustee of a special needs trust is a nonprofit organization. And there are several nonprofits in the Bay Area that will act as successor trustee of a special needs trust. Now make sure that you're specifying that it's a special needs trust because not all nonprofits will act as trustee of special needs trust, just like not all private fiduciaries will and not all banks will. Okay, you wanna find someone who really understands the public benefits laws, right? So a nonprofit organization, especially if they have the same mission that you do or you've, you've seen them in, in practice, they can be a really good choice. Also, if you're really struggling to choose a successor conservator, for your child who's under conservatorship. Some of these nonprofit organizations will act as conservator as well. So they have their own benefits. As you may know, a conservator is somebody who is able to make decisions for a child who's been conserved, who's under conservatorship. That adult child can't make those decisions anymore. Instead, the conservator does. Now, nonprofits may not be the best choice for you. They tend to be very busy, in my opinion, which means they're doing a great job, but they're serving a lot of people. They may not have the same goals that you do. Their fees might be fairly high. They might also charge the same as bank fees or even higher. The last option is to actually choose to work with a pooled trust. So a pooled trust is basically a nonprofit that pools together a lot of smaller special needs trusts. So this is really an option to not create your own standalone special needs trust, but to go with an organization. They have a special needs trust that they've already created, and then you just sign a joinder agreement to say, hey, we wanna be part of this pooled trust, okay? Then you have the nonprofit making distribution decisions and managing the underlying assets. A lot of people don't like these pooled trusts because then they can't choose who they want to be successor trustee and you don't know is this going to work out or not what if it doesn't is there a way to get your money back so these can be challenges so thank you for coming with me on my deep dive into successor trustees now this is just one element of how to create a special needs trust in california i've done a video on that entire topic and i invite you to watch it right over here i'll see you there